Give us a little brief history of your background. Let the people know who you are and where you're from. Well, I grew up in Mount Union, Pennsylvania. I graduated in 1965 from Captain Jack then, now Mount Union. I went into the military in 1965, uh, Navy. I did a year in Vietnam, three years in Europe. Got out, went to college, graduated Penn State in 74. Uh, after graduation, I went back in the military and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. I became a Medical Service Corps officer, uh, served 27 years of military service. I retired in 93. Uh, from then, I, I've been substitute teaching. I've taught in New Mexico, Virginia, Pennsylvania. I worked in the places that nobody really wants to work at. I worked in juvenile correction facilities teaching. I worked in psychiatric facilities teaching. I go to, I, I, I can teach anywhere, but I prefer teaching at a place where the demand is great and the desire to work there is little. Nobody wants to work in these kind of places, or few people do. Mm. So... This is where I am, and I came back here, and now I'm working at a vocational school at Huntington County Career and Technology Center. I work there about two days a week. It's to keep busy, stay in touch with the youth. I volunteer uh, for the VFW, uh, American Legion, in Mount Union. Uh, we've done tons of uh, community activities. Uh, since I've been there, I think we've given over $150,000 to different community events. Uh, most every school program that they have at Mount Union, Orbizonia, Shirley'sburg. Uh, we do Christmas stockings. We do Easter egg hunts. We do uh, clubs and FFAs and those types of organizations. We buy beef and cows and give them to senior centers, uh, nursing homes, uh, VA homes. We do all these things with our time and monies. And so if the kids are doing softball, baseball, teener league, football, Whatever the sport is, uh, we contribute. We participate in that community. And this is how I got my community activity started. I work in the Blue Pro community. Uh, that's a community program uh, outreach from the Planning Commission, uh, Huntington County Planning Commission. Um, we're trying to develop a, a community base group of people to understand and define what our needs, desires, and goals are. Uh, we've started building the East Broadtop Railroad through Mount Union, uh, rails to trails there at the uh, park area, putting trails in, uh, really advocating the boat ramps and advocating anything that's positive for the Mapleton, uh, Mount Union, uh, Shirley Township area. Uh, these are the areas that we're spending most of our time, efforts, and energies, and so do I. Uh, now I, I, I started talking so much smack when I went to uh, – joined the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. uh, I sat there and I was so angry when I came home and I looked at the ballot and I noticed that no Democrats were on the ballot running against people. The, the ballot was Republican or it was a write-in. Mm -hmm. So if the Republicans didn't want it, the Democrats didn't do anything. Right. And so I got involved in a Democratic committee mm -hmm. and we started uh, <coughs> moving forward. Over the last two years, we started efforts to um, motivate, uh, round up people, get them involved, uh, and, and these things are happening now. I guess my big mouth is the thing that got me to the point where I started running for the 81st Legislative District. I kept saying, we need somebody, we need somebody, and, and everybody you started... stepped right into it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I forgot my military training. You know, anytime you, you uh, say, right. let's do something, and you got the good idea, they say, well, hey, you got the good idea. <laughs> you go first. Yeah, <laughs> you jump in. And this is how I got... St uh, uh, I volunteered for this position. Right, yeah. right. Well, let me ask you this. You talked briefly about your educational background, Penn State, and now you're teaching. What was your uh, major at Penn State? Was it education or what's your background in? I'm a community developer, uh, city planner, urban studies, regional planning. I am a, uh, a medical service corps officer, you know, and that's where I spent most of my time. And it was developing medical facilities, medical uh uh, places that we constructed uh, in different countries around the world, uh, setting up different types of medical services throughout the world. Uh, so I spent most of my time uh, preparing for the worst, hoping for the best, and everything was uh, survival pretty much uh, medical. Let me, let me ask you if this is on your radar because that kind of ties into the economy and economics, urban development. 
these downtowns that are dying because the malls and the strip malls there surround them in these rural communities like uh, Huntington and Mount Union. Do you foresee getting people back to downtown, perhaps having walking malls and developing areas in downtown where streets are actually blocked off? Would that be a part of urban development, perhaps even for our area, which would help the economy in these small towns? I, I do believe that it, that would be a good approach. Uh, I, I see what Mount Union had done this year. Uh, I see what uh, Huntington is doing this year, you know, with their Mayfest. Mount Union did this mm-hmm. hubilation this winter, oh, yeah. you know, and they tried to decorate the downtown with lights to get people interested in coming down. This Mayfest where you get the whole downtown oh, community yeah. involved. I think these are the kinds of things that brings the uh, – life back to a community, you know, where you got the whole community involved. And I think we need more nonprofits. We really need to get the chamber back doing what the chamber used to do. You know, take the lead and, and be the spearhead uh, mm-hmm. to, to make sure that the community is uh, vibrant and moving forward. The, these are the kinds of organizations that make things happen. Your nonprofits, your American Legions, your VFWs, your Elks, your Moose, your Sons of Italy, you know, these are the people that are going to make the future of these communities. If they stop giving, mm-hmm. we stop growing. Right. And I, I just noticed that, you know, most of the activities that happen in these communities are generated by the citizenry, the right. small businesses. If they don't do their job... <clears throat> The borough councils, they can't do their exactly. job because they can't be everything to everybody. Yeah. So we really got to respect and appreciate and move these small businesses back into the forefront. That 300, 500 man job uh, mm-hmm. force out here is not coming this way no. anytime soon. No. We've got to start depending on these 25, 20 employee type businesses to so, grow. So that really theoretically would be a part of your vision uh, for Huntington County and your constituents. Moving forward, as you go through this campaign for the 81st Legislative District, uh, let's talk about some problem areas germane to our county. Because here again, now you coming from the Mount Union area, we often forget, and I've just been back six months after being gone 43 years, we oftentimes forget about our friends in Orbizonia, Rock Hill, Furnace, Saltilla, that southern portion of, um, of Huntington County. Do you have a vision for them as well as like those metro urban areas like Mount Union and Huntington, those little towns? How about our friends in the rural areas? You know, rural areas have the same problems as uh, Huntington does. You know, they don't have those storefronts anymore. They can't even get a corner grocery store. Matter of fact, they can't even get a a supermarket to come out there. These are the areas that we should be really... You know, from a governmental source, you know, just a standard of quality of living, standard of living, quality of living. These are the most important issues that those communities have. But all of these things will will come to pass if we can do one thing. And, you know, we got to talk about our economy. And our economy is based on employment, quality employment. Right. I'm talking about jobs that are paying a, 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 a living wage. Right. You know, the governor just came out with this 1015 law. I think he was trying to say 1515, but he, yeah. he probably couldn't feel that. Yeah. 1550. Yeah. So he I want to make that commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so he went to, it was 1010 and now it's 1015. Yeah. So I think he's sending a signal that, you know, maybe we should be at that 15. But sure. at that wage, and we can get companies to come in here. First of all, we get rid of all of these. Um, uh, Welfare uh, uh, subsidies, you know, health care. Because if you're making enough money, you can afford to pay your health care. If right. you're making enough money, you can afford to pay for your own groceries. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need those additional commodities that the state has to offer. If you're giving a, a livable wage and through employment, and if we can get employment back to this area, right, this is where we're going to grow and go Do, forward. Yeah. Do you agree? And I, I just saw this the other day where Governor Wolf enacted the uh, – ordinance or a matter of fact a mandate that they pay minimum wage which I, I assumed minimum wage was higher than 1050 uh, but the menial jobs I guess is janitor now he's paying state employees at least 1050 an hour 1015 an hour which I thought was you know ridiculous because I thought they would make at least that or more already. Yeah, one would think that. Yeah. But, you know, really, these are subcontractors that are working for the state government. And so the subcontractor is still paying that 725 oh, yeah. So now that's where that's coming into play. Okay. So, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people yeah. out there still making that 725 yeah. Let me ask you this, Rick. 
as you run for um, a state legislator, let's take a look at some of the areas that you will address, that you find key areas that you, when you get to Harrisburg, obviously, you're going to run into a, a windmill, first of all, <laughs> roadblocks, because we can't get a budget passed uh, for the last year, and we're moving towards another budget that we have to pass for 2016, 2017. In your first year, you might have to be shaking a lot of hands and kissing a lot of babies in Harrisburg. Well, you know, all this is true. Um, do you really want that job? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's a job that somebody's got to do. Yeah. And I'm not making a career out of this position. Exactly. See, this is not going to be a lifetime commitment for me. Right. Uh, I, I, I plan to do this job, and I plan to do it well enough that I'll go up to the Senate, and somebody else can come in and take over my job. Okay. You know, the better we do our job, the we should be looking for the next job right. and, pre and prepping the road for the next person coming through. Mm -hmm. You know, our whole purpose around here is not to homestead anything. Mm -hmm. Let's do our job, do it well, move forward, and bring somebody along with you. I think that the state, you know, they really have to look out for the people's interest. I represent the people as a representative of a republic. My job is to do what my constituents want me to do. If they want this piece of legislation, then I'm going to support the legislation. Mm -hmm. I'll be in contact with my constituents on a regular basis to make sure the decisions I'm making are not my decisions, but they're their decisions mm -hmm. because I am truly their representative. From what you've gathered in meeting a lot of people during your campaign, and as that process unrolls and unfurls, and we head towards a primary, which really doesn't involve you, although you'll be on the ballot, do you think, um, what's your feeling about our present administration in Harrisburg and the problems we're having down there now, and are the voices of, well, is anybody's voice being heard, not just Huntington County? Now, I think we got a polarization going on in the government right now. You know, we're pitting one group against the next group, and, and nobody's willing to be flexible to cross party lines to make decisions come true. We've got to find a way to extend our hand, cross aisles, and make stuff happen. If we don't do that, we're destined to continue this here. Mm -hmm. uh, Stop gap. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it's terrible. We, we can't go forward uh, the way we're going right now. If I'm not willing to make a concession... Yeah. and you're not willing to make a concession, we're stalemated. And we've got to get rid of that, and that's the biggest problem right now. Will you be uh, in touch with your constituents on a weekly, monthly? Of course, you'll have an office in Huntington County somewhere. Will you be, um, first of all, approachable? I mean, you have to be, I guess. Yeah. Hey, this is, this is, I'm a representative of the people, and if they can't get in touch with me, then... I don't even need to be in the job. Right. And right. I should be as regular as they need to. Let me ask you a question that I re recently asked the uh, Republican chair in Huntington County, Arnold uh, McClure. What about term limits? Are they needed in the state of Pennsylvania? Let me ask you this. In Texas, they seem to efficiently and effectively run their government in the state utilizing part-time legislators. Do you think that's something that Pennsylvania should look at? I really like term limits. I don't think that... Uh anybody's willing to put that piece of legislation to paper. I would. Mm -hmm. I think eight years is long enough for anybody to serve in any seat. Yeah, once you're done with the representative seat, you know, you got to get out or go to the Senate. If you get out of the Senate, then you got to go to governor. If right. you get out of the governor, then you got to go to federal. Yeah, I think you should be limited to eight years in any uh, political office. Situation. Well, I think there are some limitation, limitations, obviously, with the legislators because we have to vote every two years. So if the guy's not doing the job within those two years, in most instances, he doesn't go back. We've seen that happen in many instances. But speak to uh, that and uh, more importantly, what about part-time versus full-time? Is that Because it really would save us a lot of money that we seem to be spending these days and not getting anything done in Harrisburg. I would like to see this gerrymandering of the offices go out of, out of pocket right now. I think that's the worst thing that happened to this government. You know, when you're... When redistricting? You're, you redistrict, mean, yeah, redistricting uh, your legislative office. You know, if we're going to run two counties, and so fine, let's, let us be, say, Huntington and Blair, Huntington and Bedford, Huntington and Mifflin. Mm -hmm. You know, this should be your, your voting block, and it shouldn't be, you know, cutting out these cookie-cutter pieces, you know, to make... Uh, sure that I am elected next time out of the box. Right. You know, I shouldn't be looking for my job. I should be doing my job. Mm -hmm. And see, this gerrymandering is looking out for your job. Yeah. we we got to stop that. You know, you touched on the economy and the jobs. Let's talk about the infrastructure. I mean, a lot of our bridges are falling down. Our roadways are in deplorable condition because, again, remember a lot of this infrastructure was set up in the early 1900s, perhaps, or even earlier than that. Is 
that may be one of your issues too to uh, maybe do a town hall and just find out what do you need I, I think the the needs have already been identified. Mm-hmm. They've been identified by the State Department of Transportation. I mean, the engineers have been out here looking at all the bridges and roads. We know how badly our infrastructure is. Uh, I don't need anybody to tell me. Yeah. But what we need to do is we need to stop all this here um, polarization, uh, lack of funding, um, of the state government and federal government. I remember when the president came on board, he was going to uh, put all this money into shovel-ready jobs that would uh, develop all this infrastructure. And we've got the same thing happening now in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And that fact is they found out that it worked to stalemate the federal government. Now we stalemated the state government. We're not going to do anything unless we go back across the aisles. We're not going to do anything unless we got jobs. We're not going to do anything for this government unless we got these people working together. Mm -hmm. And these governmental uh, people have got to stop uh, freezing, stalemating. Right. Let me uh, get a little personal, if I might, for a moment. And I used to have this argument all the time, probably over the last 30, 40 years of my career, especially 30, in light of um, our um, institutions in Pennsylvania, uh, DOC receives one of the largest um, portions of the budget, a billion dollars, if not more. Uh, Governor Wolf uh, withheld about 900 billion or million dollars, I'm sorry, in this last budget. Uh, are we getting to the point that we're just building these prisons, Rick, and having these employees who are on this pension when we don't look at rehab? What's your feeling there? Do we need more prisons, more rehab? What is it that we need for these minimal crimes uh, instead of stockpiling these people? Yeah, we, we, <clears throat> we definitely need to start thinking about how we punish uh, people that break the law. We either have to change the law, mm-hmm. change how we enforce the law, and stop incarcerating people. And so if we if we take drugs is probably the biggest issue that we have today as far as what's uh, causing the number of incarcerated people to increase in the uh, society. Especially marijuana now. Oh, exactly. Yeah. These non uh, uh, felonious crimes, you know, uh, personal use crimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I think they ought to be uh, put in places like rehabilitation facilities take your forestry camps Mm -hmm. and let's let's start developing them into a year-long program because you know 30 days in a rehab program is really not being effective but if we take a 30 uh, a 30 day program and double it into a uh, 365 day program and put them out into a wooded area where they get physical exercise they're still getting the same amount of food services uh, that they would get in a prison Mm -hmm. they still are in confined facilities getting exercises um, and and doing the things that are necessary to be uh, an asset to our community when they come back I think this is where we ought to be spending our money and I think we ought to stop building prisons we ought to start thinking figuring ways to um, non-criminalize these people Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Just recently, I heard that the governor is all right with medicinal marijuana in Pennsylvania, and obviously the Senate is at this point ready to pass that bill. Uh, I have many friends who have seizures or friends, families, members who have had cancer, somebody with Parkinson that could have utilized that. You think we're heading in the right direction here, uh, not for recreational drugs now, but for the use of medicinal marijuana? Yeah, if I understand the legislation correctly, it's for non-smokable type uh, marijuana. And I think those are good programs. And it's not our business to be involved in the medicine as a state. You know, this is a choice for a patient and their doctor. If that doctor says this is what that patient needs, then we should be we should be out of it. Right. You know, there's a HIPAA law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it goes for if it goes for me as a non patient, then it should go for the state, and they should not have anything to do with how a patient is treated. What do you think about those people that are not um, as um, well read in the medicinal purposes of these drugs who say, but we have a heroin problem here now. we got to address it because down the road we may end up with people all doped up on, on marijuana, but we already mentioned that it's not that you smoke this marijuana, that it'll be prescribed by their doctors. But you don't see Pennsylvania enacting a marijuana law down the road, or is that something that you would even uh, broach that subject in Harrisburg? <laughs> I think any medication out here, if we're using it for a medicinal purpose, should be out of the hands of any government official. Okay. And now, for recreational use of an individual, most states out here today, you know, it's, it's a ticket. Yeah. You know, if you got a 
reasonable amount, less than an ounce of marijuana. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. Th I don't see the reason for me to stop you and put you in jail for three years or five years yeah, right. or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna make it a law, then enforce the law through citation. Mm -hmm. Anybody that knows my show knows that you know. Ever oftentimes, it's not just inform informative or educational, but it's enlightening too. I like to have a little entertainment component to it. So I, you know, and they know how. I'm not kidding when it comes to the marijuana thing, but I've often said this on the show about you know the the state has made money now off of gambling, which at one time was illegal. We make it off of booze. Of course, you know we understand the prohibition. About the only thing that we could actually probably uh, pass. And God is probably not going to happen in my lifetime, Rick, is prostitution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. not even going to get yeah. your views on that. Oh, man. Uh, I'm not the one for that one. Okay. But let me, let me just move further then. I mean, is there something, for heaven's sake, that we're not going to pass that is one of those sin taxes? Because it seems like every time we pass a sin tax, we can never go back and un untax it. Yeah, that's true. You know, true. Pennsylvania, we're getting taxed all the time. Oh, oh yeah. And, and, and really, taxing is the only way that we're going to get out of the situation that we're in right now. I don't care what anybody says. There's not enough money in the pot to pay for all of the pensions that we got right, out of here. Right. You know, this is all going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not change on yours or my retirement exactly. check. But I'm going to tell you this. There are people that are collecting a check right now that aren't going to be collecting the same check 20 years from now right. because something has to change. Nobody wants to be the one to suffer under the weight of change. Right. But we can't continue to to operate the way we are. But we seriously have to reevaluate that. And having said that, let me ask you this, because now that you brought the subject up, <laughs> these, these pensions and these schools and these schools that we're operating in, I don't have children there and... I mean, people that can, um, even government officials who can leave government after so many years making this tremendous amount of money, do you think we need to stop it now so that the next generation will pay their own freight, as we do like with Social Security? Uh, I mean, they've got to invest their own money, too. Why should the citizens have to you know, bear that burden? Well, it's just like anything. We, we have to be responsible for what we agreed upon, and we agreed upon these programs that we have now. Yes, it may cost us more tax money to fulfill that need, but the future needs of our government uh, is going to be different. When does it begin, though? Well, it's going to begin like I know for the federal government, for the military right now, the federal government, they're talking about a 401K for military soldiers that go into the military today. Right. And it's going to start January 17. Okay. And they're going to go in under a 401K. Okay. So when they get done with their 20 years, they'll have their retirement plan based out in a 401K. How quickly do you see that happening in the state of Pennsylvania? Once the federal government does something, don't you know that every yeah. state government is going to follow? True. You see what happened with Social Security the way uh, when I retired from the military, I was collecting uh, TRICARE, all right? So when I turned 65, I collect TRICARE for life. Mm -hmm. But I lose my TRICARE as my major cover. Now my Social Security, Medicare is my major cover. Right. I can see this happening in every, every governmental, every non-governmental entity. I can see uh, where Social Security is going to be the main um, carrier of health in this country because these other companies say, heck, I'll carry the 20% that they have to pay, mm -hmm. whereas I don't have to pay that 80% that I was paying before. Right. I'll pay the patients 20% that we the patient had been paying before. I can see a lot of people going to that kind of plan. I don't say this is going to be law, but I can visualize something right. like that happening. You alluded to it earlier in our conversation about uh, the um, state programs that are there now, Medicaid perhaps, or um, the health care programs, the welfare programs. What changes do we need to make in state government? Because remember, the church took care of us at one time. You know, years ago, back when you and I were younger, in the 50s and 60s, we looked to the community, but it's all changed now. We rely so much on the government, and we're just, uh, we're under the weight of a lot of, you know, money that is being doled out in many, some, sometimes uh, in really insane cases. You know, bottom line is, and down the road, as soon as we start making these changes, then the changes are going to occur, and there are right. going to be uh, sooner that rather than later, because we just cannot. We can't have a few paying for the many. Right. Whereas the baby boomer group was a many paying for the few. Oh yeah. So it was easy then, but that was just basic simple math. Yeah. And the math has just inverted itself. 
Yeah. You're going to have to start doing things that make your life better. You're going to have to start having your own 401ks. You know, the federal government just came out with this program now. It's called um, MyRA. 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 Mm -hmm. It's a program for people that don't have uh, plans in their factories or in their um, yeah, organizations. Their mm -hmm. yeah. And they can go out with this program called MyRA. And It'll set up a plan as simple as five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. it's, the purpose is to get you trained to start saving your own money, yeah. and it's guaranteed not to lose any money. Mm -hmm. And so you you continually save this money, and then once you get to a certain amount of money in there, yeah. then you want to change it over to a regular IRA, right. you know, yeah. a Vanguard, a Fidelity, you know, yeah. one of these yeah. uh, mutual yeah. funds that are going to be a Roth. IRA. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Th th these are the things that we're going to have to start looking at. And if people out here doesn't start, if they don't start looking at some of these things. Yeah. Well, I think even as a small business owner 20 years ago, I had, I think, 16 full-time employees. We offered them a, um, a Roth fund, yeah. uh, you know, and we also had something similar to a 401k. Yeah. The idea was we would, um, we would, Matter of fact, if you put in twenty dollars every two weeks, yeah. I'd match that. Sure. Now, I gotta believe those programs are still available, but it's up to the individual to take advantage of those programs. You know, people have got to be educated, and before we initiate any of these programs, you right. know, it's just like I bet you there's very few people out in your area right now that has heard of my RA. Oh, I've not heard it. Yeah. yeah. No. And you know, but this is the part that we have to start educating our populace of things that are coming. Mm -hmm. And we can't just blindside them because the government plans are, you know, short-term plans, long-term plans. Right. You know, when we when we talk about short-term plans, you and me in our home, we're talking about what's happening next week. Yeah. When the government starts talking about short-term plans, they're talking five years. Five years. Long-term plans, 10, 15 years. Exactly. See, and we've got to start thinking in long-term planning mm -hmm. in our community right. so that we can plan for our future because mm -hmm. the government's a Three's ten steps ahead of us. You're running for the 81st legislative district again. Of course, we have people in place now, uh, not to uh, malign anybody, but um, obviously you being from the Democratic Party, being the minority in Huntington County, um, why would I be compelled to place my vote for you as opposed to this other guy that's been there for a year, even though I know he hasn't done anything? <laughs> uh, but people are going to ask that question. Okay, I don't really know Rick Rogers, but what compels me to pull that switch for him this fall? Yeah, he's somebody that has shown that he can do the job. He spent 27 years in the military. He fought for your country, mm -hmm. you know? He gave up and sacrificed a lot of his life to defend your right to vote. And the only reason that you want to vote for me is because you didn't have a choice before. See, when I came back to this town, I had no choice. It was either Republican or, right. or nobody. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right in. Yeah. yeah. And so if you just want to keep the status quo, if you don't want change in your government, if you want things to run the way they have been running then I might be your choice. If you want the, if you want the freezing of your government, the, the non-productive yeah. government, yeah. you want that to continue, eh, maybe you should vote for the people you've been voting for. Mm -hmm. Since 1969, when they changed this district around, yeah, maybe you want to continue doing these things the way you've been doing it. The only way that we change, we don't have any Democrats running in Blair County, Bedford County, Mifflin County, mm -hmm. Center County. Right. You know, these have all been run by... Republicans. Republicans. And so if we want change, then we better do something different. That's the only thing that's going to change it. And I've just come up with a new campaign slogan for Rick Rogers. Catalyst for change. Rick Rogers. <laughs> I just said, you know, but anyhow, yeah. it's the Greg Banks show. Yeah. Hey, but listen, so you pretty much have said what it is you need to say. What do you, uh, where do you go from here now? What are you doing in your campaign, and how are you meeting these people? Well, basically, I try to hit every event that's going on around the county, you know, community events. And if there's one out here that I don't know about, you know, uh, let me know. Look under Rick Rogers on Facebook and politician. He, he, and send him a note. Say, hey, we're having an event. Stop by.
So you're communicating with people utilizing social media. So you have a Facebook page. Do uh, you have email and stuff like that? Or do uh, you even uh, list your number here? Yeah. We get a call Rick at 804-943-8902. That's 804-943-8902. How, how's the response been so far, though? I've had no negative uh, responses. I mean, most of the th- people are saying, hey, yeah, it's good to have people running. You know, at least I'm a choice. Mm. Before you had no choice. Right. right. I'm a choice. Yeah. 